evening, everybody. Can I have your attention, please? <laughs> I, I'm Judy Gross. Most of you probably know me. I'm the chair, chairperson of the Board of Directors of the Historical Society. So I just wanted to welcome you all tonight for our first meeting of the year. I wish we'd had a better crowd, but I thank all of you for coming. And I'm sure you'll learn a lot from our, our speaker. Um, just a couple of things before we start. Um, Sue Freeberg has planned a lot of neat meetings throughout the year, so I hope you have them on your calendar. And next month, we're having kind of a different meeting, you might say. It's um, kind of a haunted house, but not exactly. It's a historical haunted house, so to speak, because we're actually having ghosts of Washington speak, which will be ghosts of the past, some having to do with the homes that this is in. One of them is ours on 201 South Main, and the other one is John and Angie Schnippen's house across the street, um, north of our house, on the other side of Catherine. And she always decorates for Halloween, so hers will probably be even more haunted than mine, but she's also talking about the, one of the first owners, Frank Hops. His ghost is coming back to tell us what happened to him and, and some others as well. So it should be kind of fun. We're having refreshments. We are charging $5. And um, it's from 6.30 to 8.30 on the 25th. That week, all of Washington is having events going on for Halloween, pre-Halloween events. Car car pumpkin carving and storytelling in the park on Sunday and different areas. So be watching, there'll be lots of advertisement in there. There's a website too to go to for that. So, and then a couple of other things real quick I wanted to just mention. There's a, a genealogy workshop put on by, um, let's see, the Illinois State Genealogical Society, but it happens to be in Peoria this year on October 23rd. So there's some information here on this that I'll put out at the front table. It's a great opportunity because we don't have to travel far to go to it. Um, there's uh, Tazewell County Genealogical and Historical Societies have having a program they call Harvest Time for Genealogists. And um, the speaker is Jeffrey Bachman, and it has some interesting topics. So take a look at that if you might be interested. And then um, there's this other one called um, Exploring the Magic of Place that talks about museums in Naperville. And so I think almost anybody could go to that was sent to, to us, but if you're interested, um, it might be a good one to go to. That's November 3rd through 5th. I don't know if you can go to just part of it or not, but there's a website. So check that out. And um, anyhow, thanks again for coming. Press, pass the word because um, I think you know our programs are great and um, not enough people take part in it. So we need to get more people out and I'm going to hand it over. Sue couldn't be here tonight, so Ken is going to introduce our guest. And you're on. <laughs> Sue asked me if I could come and introduce our speaker tonight um, because actually he's kind of my fault. Um, we were having dinner at Sue's house uh, a while back, a bunch of us, and she said, do you know of anybody, she was trying to get the program together for the year, and said, do you know of anybody who might know something about the history that would come and speak on historical topics? And I said, oh, I've got the absolute perfect person, yes. Um, one of our good friends, Don Sturm, is the head of the history department at Morton High School, and he is the most fascinating speaker, and he's funny, and he's great. start talking like this <laughs> so that it appears and no I'm just kidding I don't uh, well thank you for coming tonight um, as Mary said I um, am I, this is awkward I've never presented in a church before and so I, I know I need to be careful here um, and I am one that likes to move around so if I am blocking the screen when we need to see something um, let me know that 
uh, title of my, well, a little bit about myself. This is my 19th year uh, of teaching. I know it only looks like I probably have been teaching four or five years, but uh, 19th year of teaching, 16 of them at Morton High School, uh, three years in a small private school in Danville, uh, taught everything from, in the social studies, everything from psychology to sociology to geography, but my love is the history. Uh, that's what I've always loved to do. I actually have a BS in history, and I love when I say that, because BS in history sounds kind of, you know. Uh, BS in history, and I have a master's degree from the U of I at Springfield in teacher leadership with a technology uh, emphasis. So when they called, and Sue said, well, would you be willing to present something? I, I took a week-long Civil War tour in the South, um, not this last summer, summer before last, and I was like, well, I mean, I could, but I think I'd bore people because it's just picture after picture after picture, and I don't really have the time to do a local study of something. Um, would it be all right to talk about like what we do in history classes now in high school and how we approach history. And I will be honest how I think we should approach history. I'm not suggesting everybody does this. Um, and so I put together this teaching history to the techie generation. By the way, on the website, I don't know who does the website, I did not spell the word relevant wrong. <laughs> okay, so nobody saw it, because as soon as I looked at it, I was like, oh no, that relevant is spelled wrong, and it's going to look like I did it. But um, what I thought we would start with, and I was going to do um, some note cards. I'm trying to think of how to say this and be nice. I was hoping that we wouldn't have any students here. That's why I said, so we can talk about them because they're not going to be here. So um, what I was going to start with is for you to finish this statement, kids today. Now I have note cards, if you feel uncomfortable talking, we could write it down, but kids today, what? Um, want to be constantly entertained. Okay, want to be constantly entertained. Love computers. Okay, love computers. Cell phones. Cell phones. Texting, Texting yeah. Don't like to read. Okay, they don't like to read. Driving. Okay, does it make you nervous? Driving and texting. Yeah, driving and texting. Yeah. Right. Other things that come to mind, like I, the L word? Lazy. I mean, sometimes that comes up, you know, kids are lazy, but everything you said is what I hear from departmental members, what I hear from people in the school, oh, these kids today. I want you to keep something in mind. Your parents said the same thing about you. No. Your parents' parents said the same thing about them. And I'm not one, I'm not here to defend everything that high school students, and I'm more of the high school expert. By the way, this is not a research-based presentation. This is anecdotal over 19 years of being in the classroom and having to change what I do based upon the kids that are coming in. Um, I think about what my parents used to complain about. My dad would make the comment that all you do is sit and listen to MTV or watch MTV. That's all you do. You're so lazy. Well, I mean, it was that every generation has gone through that. What we're dealing with is a generation of tech oriented kind of kids. And I think what happens is we have to teach history a little bit differently. So let's, uh, we're gonna do a little quiz here. Okay, um, you tell me what happened on that date. Declarations. Okay, so signing of the Declaration of Independence. Tougher one. Uh, the moon landing on the moon. Man landed on the moon. <laughs> now, if, if that date were August 6, 1969, then yours truly was born. Oh. Yeah, but it's not 1969. August 6, 1945. Uh, can you be more specific? Hiroshima. Okay, that is atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. August 9th was the uh, dropping on Nagasaki. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. It, what specifically with the Civil War? Scott. Be Fort Sumter, firing on Fort Sumter. Now, 
I'll tell you right now, if we had a group of high school kids here, they wouldn't have a clue. They wouldn't have a clue on most of those that we've put up there. History, history. It, it, exactly. To them, it is. To them, it's ancient history. Well, I will give you a hint. Washington D.C. Oh, march on the Civil War march. The Civil Rights March. Yep. So it, it, that was the "I Have a Dream" speech that Martin Luther King Jr. gave. Um, the point for doing this is. The, oh, I did have one more. That was really ancient history for all of us in here. Well, let's see, on the 18th of April in 75, hardly a man is now alive who remembers the same Close. Lexington. Yeah, that's Lexington and Concord, the night of April 19, 1775. Um, it, the point here is, for doing this, I think we, a lot of us were taught history this way. A very factual, rote memory kind of thing. And that's what everybody would say. Well, that's how you teach history. That's how you transfer the story of our country to this new generation. And then they're going to do the same, and then they're going to do the same to their kids and their kids. And my kind of premise for tonight is, and, and not just for tonight, this is how I teach my class. Now, if my students were here, I'm not going to suggest that I'm good at this all the time. Okay? I try to do this. I have this belief that as it says there, we need to teach skills rather than just knowledge. We got to balance the story. We have a story of the United States. We want to pass on that culture, but we really need to start teaching skills to students um, because they are a generation that live, it's a different generation. And uh, you know, sometimes when I talk about this with people, sometimes the older the individual, the more they kind of dig in and they'll say things like, but that's how, but that's how I was taught. And it, so it's, it's sometimes thinking outside the box a little bit. And I put in terms of skills, and by the way, we're, I'm supposed to be done by 10, right? <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, I put really the two skills up there that I think are, it's the ones I want to focus on tonight. I'm not suggesting there are only two skills. What I think is important for kids to be able to do is to what I call think like historians. And I was never taught that in school. And I had some great history teachers. How many of you know Champ Walker? Yeah. I had Champ Walker as a world history teacher, great teacher. But, and I think if I would say this if he was sitting here, I don't think he really taught me to think like a historian, but it was a different generation. I don't think I had the ability at that point and sources available to get me to think like a historian. Um, and so I'm going to talk about kind of three things within that. We need to teach students how to recognize what are quality sources. Um, there are students that have never, for a high school research project, have never been into a library. I mean, it's just that's big, and I will make jokes about it by saying things like, you know, a library has four walls and it's got shelves of books, and you know, they kind of chuckle at it. But we need to teach them what are quality sources. The idea of bias in history, bias is everywhere in history. It's it is history. It's. That's just how, I mean, history is written by individuals that have, uh, they're a certain class, they're a certain religion, they have certain beliefs. And so to try to get them to recognize bias, and then this is the one that I think sometimes makes parents nervous of my high school students, this idea of recognizing uh, various interpretations. And then people right away, well, wait, what do you mean by various interpretations? Are you talking like that we were wrong in fighting the American Revolution? I'm not suggesting that we teach one way or the other. But what are those different interpretations? If you were a Southerner in the Civil War, you have a whole heck of a lot different view of the Civil War than a Northerner. If you've been into the South lately, they have a whole different interpretation of the Civil War. Uh, they call it something different. You know, the, Nor the War of Northern Aggression in the South, we didn't call it that in the North. And so I want them to understand there are different interpretations. And then what I call hot, uh, higher order thinking skills. That's the one that I think is ultimately the most important. I think my job as a social studies teacher, a history teacher, is to teach them higher order thinking skills, how to look at certain things and derive meaning from it, make it so that they understand maybe more about today um, than they did when they walked in. So let's look at, uh, when we talk about recognizing quality sources, uh, heard about Wikipedia before. 
used it. Used it. Okay, have used it. What do you think about it? It's okay. It, it's okay for fact, for established fact. If I'm looking up an artist for art club and I need to know dates and what movement he was part of, that's fine. Yeah, I, anybody else used Wikipedia? Mm -hmm. I mean, it is, when I, I'm going to say five years ago, when Wikipedia, there was all kinds of discussion about Wikipedia. Isn't an accurate um, encyclopedia, an online encyclopedia? Maybe I should step back for a second and talk about what Wikipedia claims to be. They are an editable online encyclopedia. And by editable, I mean anybody can go in and edit articles. Now, I was one, and I'll tell you, five years ago, I was as anti-Wikipedia as you can be. I'm not pro-Wikipedia now, but I just pulled up, like, George Washington, and we're not going to read all of this, but what Wikipedia does and what we talk about with our students is you have to cite things. You can't just say things. A quality source is cited. You know where the person's coming from. And so we try to teach kids that Wikipedia is not the only source that's out there, as you said, um, it is just like, I think it's no different than, Com how many of you grew up with Compton's or World Book or something like, I mean, that's what I looked at. And I can remember my teachers saying this, don't just cite encyclopedias. All that is is factual kind of knowledge. Well, that's what that is. And so we have to teach kids that, yes, this is the encyclopedia they're used to using, but you have to think about who can edit this. Years ago, and you can't do this anymore, well, I should say you can't do it anymore. There are some articles, like George Washington, I don't know if you can see that little lock there. That is locked. You cannot go in and edit George Washington unless you have been a member for so long, unless you've kind of proven to them that you have some kind of historical background. Years ago, I went and changed the start of the Civil War in the article to something like 2065, and then ended in 2071 or something like that. And I did it on purpose. We were in the library, and this kid comes comes in, he's like, ah, oh, I see what you mean. Look at that, it says the Civil War, and I was like, I did that. Right before I walked in here, I was able to make that edit. Now, Wikipedia is smart enough that they're starting to realize that some teachers were saying, we don't want you to cite um, Wikipedia. And so um, we try to look at that idea of quality sources. All books are quality sources, right? <laughs> And see, that's the other thing. When we were, I think kids kind of see, sometimes kids see adults and teachers as hypocritical. I find that hard to believe, but they <laughs> view us hypocritical. Okay, you don't want us to use this, but didn't you use encyclopedias when you were in school? Well, yeah, but it was different because it was a book. I mean, yes, there was an editing process. And I don't know, do you know how easy it is to publish things on the internet? Easy, easy to publish things on the internet. So there is something to be said for books. Now, I've read some books that are, as far as I'm concerned, you know, out there that a secret service agent killed JFK. Um, I mean, but that went through an editing process. Um, we try to teach them that books, internet articles, whatever, there is, there are such things as quality sources, looking up authors and, um, and so forth. If we look at the idea of thinking like a historian, and again, I'm kind of condensing a lot of this, so uh, I'm used to interaction, so if there's ever anything you're like, no, I don't understand, how do you use that, whatever, we talk a lot in class about that, uh, that idea of thinking like a historian and understanding the limitations of history, and I love this, I came across it in an article, gosh, probably 10 years ago, where, it, I don't even really think it's accurate because they have the big circle being the past, that's everything that's happened in the past, and when they read an account, like a history textbook, it's one little dot. Now, I think that dot's smaller, and I think this circle is much larger, but just showing them and students this, and even some members of my department, they'd never seen it, they're like, you know, I never thought about it that way. I never thought that when you try to think like a historian, it really is difficult to do, that you have to, you know, all those things we do that no one saw and somebody has to observe it and remember it, and then somebody has to observe, remember, and record. And so you keep going down the line, and really what we get as historians is this really small dot, 
And if students understand that going in, um, I think it helps them as they're looking at things. I think it helps them start to recognize that idea of the bias that's out there. Um, this, I, I had thought about having everybody take a look at this, um, but decided against it. We, I do a lot of primary sources in here, and I started with this one. This is an English account of the Battle of Lexington. Okay, so Lexington and Concord, this is an English account. And I give two sides, and what I do is I hole punch them different ways. So I take half the class and I hole punch them so this is the top one, and then I hole punch the other ones so that the colonial account is the first one. And I've tried to see if does it matter which one you read first. And so we do this activity to start recognizing the quality of sources, the biasness that's there. This one is not as interesting because it is a report to Lieutenant Colonel Smith. And so we spent a lot of time talking about, well, if you were the Lieutenant Colonel writing to Governor Gage, he's your boss. <laughs> How are you going to write it? And, you know, kids right away. And I'm like, okay, you work at McDonald's. And something happens and you're going to report to your boss. Are you going to make yourself look good? Well, probably so. I'm not going to, you know, and they talk through that. And I'm like, okay, if that's the case, we'll think about this person writing probably doing the same kind of thing. So, like I said, this one's not near as interesting as the next one. The next one is the colonial one. And there is a, a line that I absolutely love. Um, in this source. So here, I give them the colonial count, and right away, oh, it's American history. This one's got to be the right one. And they match up on some things. They match up on how many people died. They both say eight. Uh, of course, they, you know, the uh, favorite Andy Griffith episode. Are you Andy Griffith fans where they talk about the shot heard around the world and Barney's the history expert and they go through, I mean, they talk about this is the shot heard around, we don't know who fired the first shot. To this day, we truly don't know who fired the first shot. Well, the English say the colonists fired the first shot, the colonists say the English did. But what I love about this one, and I have the kids read it and they're like, oh, okay, yeah, that's pretty interesting. And then it gets down here, to give a particular account of the ravages of the troop as they retreated from Concord to Charleston would be very difficult, if not impractical, let it suffice to say that a great number of the houses on the road were plundered and rendered unfit for use. Several were burnt. Women in childbed were driven by the soldiery naked into the streets. Old men peacefully in their house. Okay, I'm going to stop there. This line cracks me up. Women in childbed were driven by the soldiery naked into the streets. Soldiery were naked into the streets. Well, for one thing, as an English teacher, <laughs> yeah. Exactly, which they're not meaning that would be interesting. That would make it even more interesting if the soldiers were naked in the street, but they're not. Um, women in childbed, and I gotta tell you, Charleston, or I'm sorry, uh, Lexington and Concord both, you're talking 200 plus people. Anybody find anything interesting about women in childbed were running naked into the streets? And the kids will look kind of like you are, like, I don't know, what point is he trying to make? That literally means women giving birth were running naked into the streets. How many women out of 200 would have been pregnant and giving birth on April 19th? And then the kids are like, oh. And so what we, we use that to talk about, we use that to talk about, that doesn't mean this source is bad, but here's a person that they have a goal. They're trying to do something. They're trying to get the colonists all bent out of shape and anti-British. It makes it easy. I mean, what more? The only worst thing to put there is that kids were killed. I mean, that's the only thing worse you could put there. And, you know, we use that to talk about primary sources in particular. I always talk about uh, the journal that I keep when I go home every night, and I don't really keep a journal, but I think they think I do. Um, <laughs> I tell them, you know, when I go home, I'll write this lesson went unbelievably well today. I mean, I was spectacular. I could not have taught you any better on that given day. Well, uh, it's an exaggeration. I'm going to make myself feel good by writing that down. Sometimes sources tend to, uh, to do that. Um, another thing is to look at different sides of an argument. That was one of that other skills that I said in uh, that thinking like a historian. A uh, picture of Hiroshima on August 6th 1945, um, this is, ground zero was about right in here. Uh, I mean, you probably know the story, absolutely devastating. We don't know how many people, 
uh, were killed for sure, but at least 50,000, uh, numbers probably more like 75, 80,000, about that many more in, in Nagasaki. Okay, so we start talking about World War II and we talk about the end of World War II, and I show some of these pictures. Another picture of the, the devastation, and again, the kids will always ask, well, how in the world did that building stand? And I, some of those answers you just don't know, but I mean, just mass devastation. Show some pictures today. This is Ground Zero. Um, this is one of those buildings that was left standing. Uh, this is actually a student gave these to me, took them a couple of years ago. Um, so I show, go through, show some pictures. Here's what it looks like today. There's still devastation. There's actually a museum there. And then we start looking at, okay, what should we have dropped it? Should we have dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Kids, I think, today are less willing to just take from authority that, yes, we should have dropped the bomb. I think you have to get them to think about it, to come to their own conclusion. Again, here's where it gets nervous, because while well, my grandfather fought in Japan, and absolutely we should have dropped it. I don't have, that's fine. I, that doesn't bother me at all. But let's look at what those other sides are. What, what are those people who say we shouldn't have dropped it? What are they thinking? Uh, and so forth. So then what I start to do is to show them different sides of it. Um, you know, when the bombs dropped, the news began to uh, circulate that the invasion of Japan would not happen after all, or I'm sorry, would not after all take place, that we would not be obliged to run up the beaches near Tokyo, assault firing while being mortared and shelled. We cried with relief and joy. We we were going to live. We were going to grow up to adulthood after all. Okay, so now you see those devastating pictures, but you read an American soldier that says, I'm going to grow up to adulthood after all. And then if I tell them, well, this 21-year-old soldier then got married when he went back, and then he had kids, and now those kids, I mean, you start that generational kind of thing. Thank God the war is over, and I don't have to get shot anymore. I can go home. Okay, so that would be a legitimate feeling. Then I show them some, these were drawings done by children. Um, in Japan. So again, you know, I, <laughs> the kids always ask me, what's that say? No idea what that says. I just look at the pictures. I mean, there's obviously some suffering um, going on. Then I give them some primary sources from the Hiroshima students that were there. You know, I felt as though I'd been struck on the back with something like a big hammer thrown into boiling oil. The vicinity was in pitch darkness from the depths of the gloom. Bright red flames rise, crackling and spread moment by moment. The faces of my friends who just before were working energetically are now burned and blistered, their clothes torn to rags. And again, we get the same kind of idea, that idea of they all had skin blackened by burns. What I think is important as a history teacher is yes, I'm teaching American history, but let's get them to look at, you know, like I said, those Americans that believe that we shouldn't have dropped the bomb. Why is it that they would be saying that? Then to get them to start thinking about, okay, what do you believe? What's your thought about it? Um, back it up then with things. Go out and find sources. If you think we should have dropped it, why do you think we should have dropped it? And a lot of them will come back and say, well, we should have dropped it because we had tried all these other options. We didn't want to invade. It was going to take up to a million lives to be able to invade. Some will come in and say, well, and if, what do you think most students say? We should have or shouldn't have dropped it. And I'm thinking Morton, Illinois, I mean, that's the really the reference I have. What do you think they say? Should. Should, have. should have. Most of them, and that's where that culture of history, they've been taught it at home. They may not have sat down and said, oh, well, we believe, son or daughter, that we should have dropped the bomb on Hiroshima. They've heard things from grandparents. And so just to get them to see the other side, a lot of times it doesn't change their mind. They just look at it differently. Um, I try to show them, and I, this is kind of hard to see. I came across this. Um, we talk in class as we're doing the atom bomb in that title, The Atom Bombs in Perspective. You know, if you look at deaths, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, really far up there, but you look at fire bombings of Tokyo and Dresden, I mean, we dropped carpet bombs on other cities, killed just as many people. You don't hear a lot about that. We tend to hear so much about that instantaneous, you know, one millisecond that just wiped out a whole population. But we had been doing that in the war. I mean, we had been doing that. So then we get to talking about what's worse. Should you just drop the bomb and get over with? 
Should you, is firebombing any more legitimate? What role does civilians play in war? Are there really civilians in war? It's that discussion that I think, for one, brings it home to them because it isn't just me saying, okay, on August 6, 1945, the U.S. dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, or on Hiroshima. Uh, it was a little boy that was dropped and it was this kind of explosive power. That's how I was taught it. It was just, here's this list of facts about it. I try to get, and don't get me wrong, they have to have the facts. I mean, I provide at like the start of a lesson, okay, here's what we're talking about. When we talk about the atom bomb, here's what happened. About a thousand feet above the ground, it detonated. And, you know, we go through all of that. Here's, give me some reasons why we, sh why we did drop it. Not whether we should have or not. Why did Truman say we should drop this bomb? And so we talk about those factual kinds of things, but then I try to get them to do um, something else with it. Um, the other things is that idea of higher order thinking skills, and I tell you, trying to organize this because there's so many different ways of doing this, um, to get them to think about things. Um, I use a lot of uh, pictures, and I, you know, I don't know what the best way of approaching this is. That's maybe not the best one. Um, doesn't show up really well here. This is my favorite. Anybody know what this is that you're looking at? Uh, it's the trenches in Germany during World, War I. during World War I. And I love this picture. It's my favorite one because it's hard to pick out the men. And so I talk about why is that? You know, they've done some reading on it. And I will just put this picture up on the board. And sometimes we'll talk about this picture for 20 minutes. And I'll say, why would I pick that as a good representation of World War I or the trenches in World War I? And you get responses like, well, they, they tend to blend in. I mean, they, they get into this thought kind of process. But I love it because you can't hardly really tell where the trench starts and ends, and then I start talking about, I use this as a lead in to a question that is simply war is. And then they have to fill in the blanks with adjectives. And <laughs> in an English teacher, I have to remind them of what an adjective is, but then we, <laughs> then we go through and we talk about, okay, war is, and that it's, it is interesting to get their idea of war. Some of them, a lot of the girls, war is dirty. That's one of the first things they say. And so then that starts a conversation uh, off on one direction about the, the cleanliness of war. And I purposely left out uh, my favorite picture from World War I, which is a case of good old trench foot that they got from, let's just say, take your, take your bathtub, fill it with mud and gook and all kinds of stuff, and then stick your foot in it for about a month and watch what happens to your toe or watch what, I mean, it just starts to clean. And so then we'll talk about that. Could you be clean in that kind of situation? And then some kid will invariably raise their hand. Uh, how did they go to the bathroom? And I've had kids raise their hand and go, would it really matter? I mean, look at that. It wouldn't matter. And so it gets them to try to put themselves in the place of that soldier, which I think then as we go on in the lesson helps them uh, be able to relate a little bit more to it. These next few, um, I do a lot on World War II, and I'm a picture fanatic. I mean, we see all kinds of photographs. This is on uh, the morning of uh, June 6th, 1944. So this is uh, D-Day. And we, you know, I will, I don't have it here, but I will actually circle this guy. They would have done a reading about D-Day and what it was all about. And I just say, you write a letter back home, you're that guy. And it's interesting to get their action. You know, some of them talk about being scared. Others talk about the excitement. Others talk about, I mean, it's just, it gets the students talking in different directions uh, about D-Day. And then what I do is then I offer, okay, here you are in the channel going over. Now you've gotten into the landing craft and now what's going through your mind? And so I just keep walking them through it. Okay, now things have changed. I was no, no longer was I 20 miles away. Now I can see it, I can hear it. A lot of times with this picture, I will ask them right now, you know, whichever, and I do that, they think I'm dorky, but I will circle a guy and say, you're that guy, what's it smell like? What's it taste like? Uh, what's it feel like? What, I mean, try to get them to think about the senses. You can't teach what it was like to be there. 
I mean, we can show them Saving Private Ryan until we're blue in the face, and I love the beginning of the movie, but you really, I mean, you don't know what it was like. And so the best we can do is to try to get them to think about uh, that. We then get into, okay, now the front's gone down. Uh, now what are you thinking? And enough of them, um, here's where I would bring in the video games. Kids play video games a lot. You would be amazed how much history a lot of the males will come in with because they play like Call of Duty. And you might go, I don't know what Call of Duty is. It's a World War II game. They will know, oh my gosh, that's in the mission where we have to take this hillside because there are German pillboxes. They've never read a thing about it, but they've played that video game and they have a little bit more uh, kind of interaction with this. We then talk about different roles at D-Day. <laughs> And I show this one, and I say, you know, you must be, can you imagine being this guy and this guy and so forth? And then I'm like, imagine the person taking the picture. Yeah. And they're like, what do you mean? And I'm like, somebody had to take that picture. And chances are it was, you know, and we use that term embedded reporter. Well, there were embedded reporters back then. I said, chances are, I'm not sure that person had a gun with them. Their sole job was to document the war. I mean, I'm not suggesting I would rather be this guy or the reporter, but it does make you look at things differently. And then this one, that is probably the eeriest picture, I think, from World War II. I mean, this is, and I ask the kids, look at this picture, what's going on right away? Oh, it's blurry. Okay, well, think about why it's blurry. The person's running. And then to get them to think about, um, is it, what do we gain from photographs like this? I mean, even back to that idea of thinking like a historian. Is there value in this picture of, you know, the World War II experience? Um, you can get kids to think critically, I think, by looking at maps. And I'll show you a few here uh, of maps that I use in class. One of the things, I, I, I don't know that I've been real popular with my department when it comes to this. I have a certain amount of money in my budget that I have to put towards certain things. And um, one of the things we don't buy in our departments anymore are those pull-down maps. Remember those in school? You know, the pull-down maps. Or the stand that looked like this, only smaller, and the teacher would be like, and they're flipping through, and they pull, you know, and then they pull them over like that. I mean, those are, one pack of those maps is right around $2,000. This cost me nothing. Now, my principal would go, uh, the computer, the smart board, the, you know, all of that. But you can, uh, this map, anything look funny about this map? Anybody know why I put the numbers upside down? I didn't make either one. I didn't take this one. I didn't make this. I just put these two together. <laughs> Oh, you matched them up. Exactly. I had them, a lot of times they'll see this picture turned around or this diagram turned around. So what I've tried to do is to show them this right here is that right there. They're looking at it in the same, like how many of you have to take a map and turn it the way you're going? How many of you have a GPS and you always have to, anybody drive with north up? <laughs> It's the weirdest thing ever. Most people have it where you're actually seeing it just like it is. A turn right means turn right. Well, kids like to have that oriented. So we go through and talk about, you know, would use this when it comes to Pearl Harbor uh, and the attack. And again, even getting into, you, know, you start counting, you know, one, two, three, four, five, I mean, all these, what in the world? did we have all those ships in Pearl Harbor for? And, you know, we get that might even generate that kind of discussion. Um, I thought I had another, you know what? <laughs> Good old Nixon. Um, I had that one nestled in the wrong place. Let me go back. Um, this is as easy as it gets with a map. I mean, you're talking about World War I on the Western Front. Um, I, that map cost me nothing. It comes from the textbook company. It's just as effective, I would argue, more effective because do you know what a smart board is? 
I have one, that's why this is awkward to me. I'm used to, I'm a pointer and I can do everything on my computer with my fingertip, um, but I can draw on this map. If I would have drawn on that $2,000 set of maps, they would have, I mean, I can annotate on this and then I can go and hit save. I can then, one of the other things I do, and this is kind of a, a side note, I keep a, I do a podcast site for my students, so I record daily or weekly summaries for them. I can annotate these maps. If a kid's gone, I can go in on the board and draw. Now we focused on Verdun right here and we did, and then I can link things through it. So I think students who are of that techie generation, they just expect that. You know, the idea of looking at a pull down map just isn't going to do it for them. This is one where, and if I was the author of the textbook, both of these are in the same textbook. All I did is scan them in and said, okay, we're talking about uh, the Bataan Death March in Corregidor. Well, here's the map that shows the Philippines. Well, when we talk about that, here is this close-in map of it. So you can take all different kinds of maps, move them together. This is what kids do when they present a PowerPoint presentation for a class. They take, oh, oh, I should probably mention something. Copyright laws. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, sometimes teachers are the worst when it comes to the copyright laws. I do try to keep it, this is the textbook that we use. So we, no, it, that still doesn't make it right. I mean, technically, that still doesn't make it right. Kids break copyright laws all of the time. And that's, I think, is another discussion. I think we need to teach them to cite sources and where this came from and so forth. But again, very easy with a map to be able to say, here's the part of the world um, that we're talking about. Um, again, just another map that scan in. And a lot of times when we look at, North Africa gets overlooked in World War II a lot. And we always talk about the importance of North Africa in Sicily and then Italy is up in here. And something as simple as this map, that's, that's never been on a pull down map that I've seen. And what we do is talk about what would be, this was us. These were not the crack troops, the German crack troops or British crack troops. So why did we land here? Why did we let the British handle over here? And what were we doing? Well, it boils down to they start finding out our army at the start of the war was not our army at the end of the war. And so this was practice. And so then they start to see, oh, I, this is practice. We're beach landing here, and then we're gonna move across, and then we're gonna beach land here, and then we're gonna beach land onto Italy, and then we're gonna beach land at Normandy. And they start to see, I think, um, that idea of just by taking maps. And a lot of times, I don't think we do enough with maps um, in school. And again, technology-wise, very easy to, um, to do that with. Uh, I am, I don't know, infamous for political cartoons. In fact, we have a test in my American history class on Wednesday, and when I told the kids there were gonna be three political cartoons, they are like, oh, I hate political cartoons. Um, I think political cartoons are maybe one of the highest order level thinking that you can have. If I gave, like, how many of you remember this? Watergate, Nixon, Okay, you give this to a student, they don't have any idea. They may recognize that guy as Nixon. Nowhere does it say Nixon. Sometimes they'll see Watergate and they'll remember that. But that cartoon, you have to understand the time period and the event in order to get that cartoon. And so one of the ways that I try to incorporate into every unit is you need to be able to show me that you understand the background information. I'm not gonna just wrote memory on the stuff, but show me that you understand what that means. What's the symbolism there? Who are these guys behind um, the, and it's funny because when I say the plumbers, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean anything to them, but if they've done the reading and a kid puts that idea of the plumbers in and who the plumbers were and what this tape machine is, one of my favorite ones. And, you know, it's that I'm not a crook, and you give that to a student at the start, and they're like, what? That doesn't even make any sense. Well, then you start talking about the 18-minute gap, and, you know, 
his secretary, leaning across, I don't know if you remember that whole thing where she testified and said, well, it was that I accidentally pressed my foot here and I was leaning over here answering a phone. I mean, in other words, she was basically saying, I'm just trying to make something up. I mean, I think we all know she didn't really erase that, but <laughs> that political cartoon really makes kids think about those kind of factual things that are there. And that's what I mean by, I think you still tell the story of America. You still teach by telling the story of America, but you can do it in ways that gets them to think about it. Um, they don't know this, but this is the, I don't think anybody's here. These are the political cartoons they're going to see on the, uh, the test. But they have to understand Roosevelt and what one phrase will I expect to see when they answer this political cartoon. Yep. Speak softly and walk softly, and, but carry a big stick. I mean, that idea of you have to have uh, that idea, and we've talked a lot about that, and you know our role in the Caribbean and so forth. And we don't have to look at all of these, but. Um, Like it came out of the New Yorker, did it? Um, I think this one did come out of the New Yorker, and I actually have these cited, uh, but for some reason it's not showing at uh, the bottom. This is when the Panama Canal was being given back to Panama, and then there was that whole rehashing of should Carter have done that or not, uh, and. Um, Teddy's a little upset. Yeah, and Teddy's a little upset. And again, what the kids have to know, and here's what I love about this one, because this is actually during the Carter administration, but they have to talk about Teddy Roosevelt, and I'll invariably hear this, but that was last semester that we did that? <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, but I don't expect you to re or forget it uh, the minute that you walk out of class. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And again, they have to get the idea here, and there might be some looking at that going, I don't know what that means. Um, but that F uh, Ford was accused of being really just like, especially when he pardoned. And so that's what the kids do. Then they're like, oh, that has to do with the pardoning. And this cartoonist is anti-Ford because he's just really Nixon underneath. And I, this may sound kind of dorky. There's nothing better as a teacher to have a kid that gets that. And they don't just say, oh yeah, this is about Nixon and Ford. I mean, they actually put some detail in, and as a teacher, you're like, okay, that's exactly what I wanted them to get out of that particular um, discussion. A couple of other things here, and then I'll see if there are if questions that you have. Um, I like to use a lot of um, quotes, and again, I just, I will go through, and when I find things, whether it's in what I read, I will put them up there. I'm notorious for putting these on test and saying this is a, this would be, I can see doing this on a test. In fact, I just thought of this right now. I would put this on a test. Comment on the following. The truth is that progressivism was less on a minority movement and more a majority mood. And based on what we've done and how I've taught, a student should be able to provide some of those background details to that to make that source or to make that quote make some sense, to put it in some context. A lot of quotes. Um, and again, some of these. Well, let's do. There we go. Um, yeah, see, I'm missing down here. But again, this one is my favorite one to read to them. And this is how I started. I just did this a week or so ago. I was like, the progressive mind was preeminently a Protestant mind. And even though much of its strength was in the cities, it inherited the moral traditions of rural evangelical Protestantism. The progressives were still freshly horrified by phenomena that we now resignedly consider indigenous to urban existence. I'm like, yes. Is that not awesome? <laughs> and they're just looking at me like, you not know what that means? And this, time, this year was funny. I had this kid go, I got stopped it preeminently. <laughs> I didn't know what that word meant. And I said, okay, go through that. And I think sometimes when we talk about kids being lazy and the fact that somebody made a comment they don't read, that is no joke. They don't read. Now, you probably don't want to hear me say this, but I've seen some research done that reading... Reading is a skill that 25 years from now, 
Careful. It's, I, I know, I, I love to read. I mean, on my phone, I have 15 or 20 books right now that I love to read. But students, they chunk things. They don't read five, 10 pages at a time. I can remember homework assignments that I would get in high school on history. It's 20, 25 pages. If you gave a 20 or 25 page assignment on, on a history book to a student, they would not read it. Now, some would but most would not read it. And so what happens is, I think they get stuck. I don't think they've been, I mean, they've been taught to read, but I think they struggle with the process of reading. So I, I told them, I was like, well, if you get stuck on that word preeminently, okay, go on. You don't have a dictionary in front of you. They see Protestant, and they're like, Protestant, and this is Morton. Protestant. So, and I was like, just what, what kind of mind? A Protestant mind. And somebody finally raised their hand. You mean like just a religious mind? Yeah. And so they've got religion going on in their head. That's what they're thinking. And so we start walking them through it. And then this last statement, I mean, we spent probably 20 minutes on this one quote trying to break it down. That idea of we're still freshly horrified by phenomena that we now resignedly consider indigenous to urban existence. And I just ask them, how many of you have ever been, how many of you can remember when you saw your first homeless person? And almost everybody kind of shakes their head and nods. And I said, okay, for me, that was when I was seven years old in Chicago. Now I walk by them, it doesn't have the same impact. I mean, here are people that are going to cities. That's all that means. They resignedly consider indigenous. Now we just assume there are those problems there. And I think sometimes students with the reading, with the aspect of reading, they look at that and their mind just completely shuts off. And you do know, right, when they read, they don't just read. Mm -hmm. Anybody have to have it completely quiet when they read? They like music. Oh, they have their music on, they have a TV on, they're playing, the, they're, they're in between sets of rock band, they're doing all kinds of things like that, and they don't focus on the task of reading. So I think sometimes these quotes forces them to look at um, things. Um, a lot of graphs and things like that. This is an, actually an essay question that is at the end of the year, and again, a little bit difficult to see in this format, but I put these three graphs, well, no, they're not all graphs, but, um, and I say, talk about the 1980s. And that's all I say. Talk about the 1980s. And they have to get at the idea of the defeat of Carter in 1980. They then get into, um, you know, the, the deficit, and I tell them when we talk through how to answer something like this, they don't just start and they talk about this one and they talk about this one and they talk about this one. They've got to relate those things we've talked about in class to um, these graphs. And again, this is something schools today are all worried about the ACT at the high school level. We've got to make sure you're focusing on the ACT. These are the kinds of things that kids see on the ACT. You know, they will see these charts and graphs and have to, um, to do things with them. The other thing, and I'll kind of end with this one, um, there's a great website called Wordle, and they create what are called word clouds. This is a word cloud. And what I do for the students is I tell them that they need to come up with 15 words that describe a particular group of people. So in this case, they had to come up with 15 words that described a progressive. And so you then type these all into this website and the word that is used most often appears larger. So reform, a lot of them, probably every one of them use the word reform. And then I do that for each class. And then I go through and I put all of them together and I say, okay, this is 90, this represents 94 kids. Here's what they said about progressives. Then what I do is say, okay, you have to pick out six of those words and you have to prove to me that they were, that that is a good description. So if you say they were democratic, out six examples that from the book that show that they were democratic. Uh, if you think they were, and some of them are kind of funny because they don't know how to do it and I don't know that I can pick one out. Um, like this one makes sense, like they were clean because they talk about uh, urban life was supposed to be clean, but some of them will put dirty. And what they're trying to get at is they were trying to clean up the cities. And so we have to kind of talk about that. The, when you're describing someone, you're not, you're describing them, not what they're trying to, um, 
to do. So, and then, uh, actually I lied, I said I would in with this one. Um, this is an assignment I do at the end of the year. Um, we actually have started teaching history differently in Morton. This is the third year. We start in 1900 and we end with the Clinton administration. And so we're one of the few schools in the area that actually teaches modern history. So we spend about a month with uh, the Vietnam War. And what we do is I give them an assignment to go out and you know a lot of them have been to the wall but and I we do search the wall what you can do and I don't know if you're aware that this is there um, hopefully nobody does this because they have a family member but they can go in and I tell them in this case they need to pick either a birthday like somebody who has the same birthday that they do they go in and um, they type that in and what they'll be given is well let's see if I can This would be my birthday. Yeah, and this is so awkward, I'm so used to. Oh, and of course, <laughs> no service members have been found. Um, if I did a casualty date, what it would do is give me, and I think it must be casualty date, it will list 25 or 30 uh, people and then there is a section on the wall that actually has comments that are left by family members so what I do is okay you, when the moving what gave me this idea is when the moving wall came to Morton we walked down there and I said before they did it you need to find a person you need to find out about them you need to try to do some research and it's amazing how much stuff is out there um, and then you need to go get a rubbing on the wall and to try to make that connection that that name on the wall is a person who was an in infantry they have to find out where they were at they have to put that on a map here's where so just to try to get them to make it more than just those um, those facts so um, questions that you have at all I mean I could keep going with this but do you have them writing I, they're seeing lots of things and they're talking. Are they writing? Yes. Um, there is a, there's quite a bit of writing in my class. I'm not one that does, in my honors class, there's a lot of writing. In my standard level classes, there's writing, but they're shorter kinds of things. And so, yeah, that's what I've left out. A daily kind of start is, here's a question on the board, or a picture on the board, I want you to do this, and I want you to write about this. So, yeah, I think writing is um, really important. They don't like to right no um, but you know what they're really surprisingly not as bad at it as I think people perceive you know sometimes you hear uh, have you ever seen jaywalking yes. from the I don't know where they get those people from I mean maybe I do I just I, there can't be people that truly yeah and I'm not going to say that word so somebody else said it where do they get those people at I mean yeah we have students that come in with not a lot of background and they're not very good writers but by and large I mean the kids that I get and you know somebody right away would say well but think about the community you teach in and central Illinois tends to be like that absolutely I mean I you know we I am uh, blessed teaching in central Illinois, and particularly Morton, I mean, I love it there, but I, the writing, yeah, it's a big component. In fact, I came in today and said, hey, let's start off Monday with some fun, and you know, oh, and I was like, take out a sheet of paper, oh, you know, and they kind of <laughs> roll their eyes, but uh, other questions at all? How big are your classes? I have, uh, my American history classes are right at about 30 uh, students. Well, actually, two of them are 30. One of them is 25 or 26, and then I teach a dual course or an American history, American literature class that's a two-hour block of time that has um, 25 students in it. So, I teach all juniors. Yeah, I taught freshman for years, and I was, I gotta watch, because this is gonna be on TV. <laughs> I, I taught freshman for years, and I just, I like the juniors. 
Yeah, I like the juniors. You mentioned your smart board. Do the students get up and participate? In you know, I, my smart board is relatively new, so I'm getting used to it. I think the smart board is a technology that is awesome at the grade schools. Um, it is useful at the high school, but you don't, I mean, kids have iPod touches and iPads. It's not that big a deal for them to come up and move things along the screen. I mean, they do that all the time. Um, I do activities, though, where... In, <laughs> Sometimes it drives me absolutely crazy because they, they, along the bottom are um, like four pens. I mean, they're not really pens, but when you pick up the red one, it, it will write in red, and you will invariably have this kid that thinks I can pick up two of them at the same time, and I can try to write like this. Well, then it messes everything up. It locks the computer up, and you're like, no, just one at a time. And then you think their handwriting's bad on a piece of paper? Have them write it on a computer screen and see how, I mean, it's like you're, oh my. And my handwriting's not any better. Um, it's, so I'm starting to get used to it. It is, I think, great for grade schools. I mean, just the, the stuff that they can do with it. And again, a, a kindergartner, first, second grader, just that being able to manipulate things is a good, um, a good thing. But just because your iPod screen is large. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was, I, mean, I didn't know I had that um, open. I mentioned that I do, um, this is my website where, um, you know, I can put things that we did. This is what we did. Um, well, it'll be, it, in fact, it's not going to open it because I don't have Adobe on there, but um, I encourage kids to use it. And this is over three years. I don't mess with this number. So it's had 8,900 um, hits over the last three years. So it's something that they tend to find useful. I do those weekly summaries and it's funny. I tell them, now I'm going to post one on Saturday. You make sure you download that and listen to it and they're like, oh, okay, we will. You know, that last thing I would have done when I was in high school is download my teacher's podcast and listen to it on a Saturday. Normally what they'll do is before a test, if there's two or three of them before a test, they'll uh, download those and um, we'll help them review. Yes? see the special on Fox News that's been within the last month. It was on three or four sessions and they did it over again a few times. But it, it was dealing with the uh, different groups in the country that are struggling, political groups, to get control of the textbooks. I, ha I didn't see that, but I'm somewhat familiar with um, the situation. And it's, Texas. yeah, I was going to say, Texas has always been, um, Texas is an interesting state when it comes to um, history. And I don't know how much you know about Texas. And I, is anybody from Texas? Okay, and I, I say that kind of in jest, but... In, <laughs> is what I always say. It's like the people from Texas think they were like a country once, which they were. Yeah, that's what, yeah. The humor in that is that they were a country at one point and they really are like Illinois history. Our kids are supposed to learn Illinois history. I, we do very little with it. At the high school level, we do almost nothing with Illinois history. Um, we do more about history of Chicago and Springfield and things like that. We don't do the history of Illinois all that much. But Texas, they get into the textbook business because their history, I mean, every student in Texas schools has a year of Texas history. So they become really fixated on the history books. Well, then every other state follows suit. Now you get in it. It sort of drives me crazy because, like I was just saying, I think you can teach history and you can get kids to know the story of the country without just telling them this was the right thing and this is the wrong thing. And I think there are so many groups on either side. There are groups that on the left say we need to teach about every single group that ever had anything to do with the United States. We need to teach about this ethnic group and this ethnic group and this. It's impossible to do that. But then on the other hand, we have the really right-leaning that will say everything we do needs to be pro-American. And I, 
as a history major, that bothers me because history is interpretation. History is um, bias. It's like I said, it's recognizing it. It's being able to talk about it. So um, we're going through a textbook study at Morton and it'll be interesting to see. We've had some times where people will pick our history textbook up in the library and they will go through and write down, here's how many times George Washington was used. Here's how many times W.E.B. Du Bois was used. Here's how many times Martin Luther King Jr. was used. Here's how many times Sacagawea was used. I mean, they'll, and we don't do that as teachers. I mean, I, I teach and try to provide them a well-rounded, here's a way of looking at this topic. Um, and so the, the textbook thing scares me um, a bit, but I'll have to watch the thing on Fox News. I had heard that it was on, just didn't watch it. Um, one thing is they said that Texas put so much emphasis on it that so many states just kind of use their, their outlines and textbooks. Well, and partly it is because the textbooks, the companies, they produce textbooks all over the country with the Texas model. That's what it was, the companies do. Yeah. And you don't have any choice. Well, and, and that's a whole other presentation. When you go to, when I was in school, I would say there were... 10 textbook companies now, and I'm not, don't quote me on this, I, now there's like three. They have different names. They might be 10 different names, but if you look at the book, uh, Hardcore Brace and Jovanovich is the same as, and I don't know if this is the case, but Holt Reinhardt, that's the same as, I mean, their books look the same. And um, I'm reading this book now called, and I can't think of the, I have it on me. I can't think of the guy's name. Uh, Sam Weinberg wrote this book called Historically Thinking, and it's fascinating. He talks about that idea of history textbooks do not make you think like a historian. They make it seem like this is how it was. This is how it was. And so I think I can see a time when I could get away from textbooks solely, I mean like not even really have to use them. Um, I would like to, oh, my favorite project, my dream project would be to have a textbook written by students where they have to go out and do the research and then you put it all together and this is, now it's, it's a history of the United States based upon high school juniors, but that, that would be a valuable document. I mean, that is something to look at and then compare it to somebody who's a PhD at Yale or somebody who's a PhD at, and then we get in talking about that, something that's written by somebody who's a PhD at Berkeley. Well, that's way different than somebody written PhD at U of I. I mean, and the kids will kind of, they don't really understand that, but it's like, okay, read this. Read about Kent State from somebody who taught at Berkeley. They have a completely different viewpoint of Kent State than they do somebody who taught at a more conservative university. So that's why I think history is so fun. Because it isn't just one thing. Like math, two plus two is always four. Unless you add an imaginary number in there and I've never understood that. But uh, I mean, they've got that thing. I mean, for us in history, you can look at things. I can teach something this year and have a class that wants to veer it in a different direction the next year. And so then you start to look at different interpretations. And then you have some kids, honestly, they don't like this. They just want to be taught. Like, they don't care about interpretation. They just want to know what the answer is. And there isn't an answer so many times in history. So. I think all of us have had history teachers through the years, various history teachers. You will have some that bore you to the point of a comatose state. And then you will have others that just make it come alive and make it real and make it relevant and exciting and interesting. And it all depends upon the approach and the people who are just blathering the facts and you're supposed to memorize it. And I just think that that's... And I mean, I think about, like I said, I was a history major. I don't know, and I loved my history teacher in school. Um, but I don't remember the, I mean, that's not where I, I didn't learn the facts from any teacher. I learned it because I liked it, and I knew that's what was gonna help me in the classroom to be able to, I don't know, interpret things for kids. I don't even, but I did not, even in college, I mean, there wasn't, you didn't have all these dates that you had to memorize. And I'm not a good date person. Um, so. 
Other questions, comments? Okay, well thank you for coming. I don't know if there's anything else that... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.